I learned during my years in state government and then at the national level how important free market think tanks like the Washington Policy Center are. And a lot of it is because of the work that's done in think tanks in policy centers like the Washington Policy Center. What the Washington Policy Center opposes is anyone who believes that politics is the answer to all of society's ills. To be an independent voice that can speak on the authority of well-researched, unbiased knowledge, and that is what the Washington Policy Center does so well. What a thrill it is here to be at the Washington Policy Center. I want to congratulate this wonderful organization for 20 years plus of helping to bring great ideas to the people of Washington. The Washington Policy Center, which does spectacular work. And institutions like the Washington Policy Center and its research centers make politics not only more intelligent, but more noble. And I thank all of you for supporting it. I understand there are these think tanks in all 50 states. But of course, the Washington Policy Center was right at the forefront of this movement. We are not fixing the institutions that are broken. And Washington Policy Center and Cato Institute and Heritage and these great think tanks have so many wonderful opportunity, uh, ideas. I generally leave my audiences so depressed that I feel that I should pull out my prescription pad, because I still can, and write a prescription for antidepressants. I bring you greetings from one of those flyover states. One of those I states, I think you call them out here. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you uh, to the Washington Policy Center. This think tank is absolutely wonderful. The Washington Policy Center for inviting me, but for the good work they do in this state, the inspiration uh, they have to other think tanks. All right, good evening. Wasn't that great to see all those speakers that have graced this podium over the years? And we have a great program to add to that video. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this very special evening, Washington Policy Center's 2014 annual dinner here in Eastern Washington. I'm Dan Mead Smith. I'm the president of the Washington Policy Center, and it's a delight for me to be here in person to welcome over 700 of you tonight. If you've attended our Eastern Washington Annual Dinner in the past, you know it's been a simulcast event. We've had the chance to hear from tr some tremendous speakers, including last year, Dr. Ben Carson, Governor Scott Walker. But those speakers have often been with us in Western Washington, where I've been. Coming up next week, we'll hold our annual dinner in Western Washington featuring former Defense Secretary Robert Gates. But this year, to celebrate the fifth anniversary of our Eastern Washington office, we have changed the simulcast arrangement and have brought two terrific speakers here to Spokane. Even better, our Champion of Freedom Award recipient is from Eastern Washington, who you'll meet in a little bit, as is our Jennifer Dunn Thompson Scholarship recipient, also this year from Eastern Washington. Eastern Washington is cleaning up in 2014, which we're excited about. <laughs> Greg Porter, our board chairman, and I are usually, like I said, at our dinner in Bellevue or Seattle. So now that we've separated the dinners, it's, it's a thrill for us to be here in person rather than only on the video screen and to see this tremendous outpouring of support that we have in Eastern Washington. One thing that hasn't changed is our Master of Ceremonies. We have been so honored to have Robin Nance lead our festivities. Robin, of course, is a familiar face, the anchor of Good Morning Northwest at KXLY 4 News here in the Inland Northwest. She's been a trusted voice on the local news since the mid-1990s, and it's an absolute privilege to have her running the show again tonight. 
Ladies and gentlemen, Robin Nance. Dan, thank you so much. It is really great to see you and Greg on this side of the state. It's nice. You're not just flat. <laughs> which I probably look flat often too. Um, it is a pleasure for me to be able to join you again this year for this wonderful educational event. As Dan said tonight, we welcome two tremendous speakers, one-time college football star and former Congressman J.C. Watts of Oklahoma, plus Forbes columnist, best-selling author, and presidential historian Amity Schles. Now, normally I would say, I really, you know, keep your phones down, let's turn them off, but if you are on Twitter, how many of you are tweeters? There are a few of you out there. Well, it, it, it's okay to use your phone because we, we want to spread the word about all the good things happening tonight. So if you do tweet tonight, we ask you to hashtag EWA Policy AD. EWA Policy AD, make sure you tag us. It'll be fun to keep up with what everybody's uh, thinking tonight. And combined with the event going on next week in Western Washington, WPC's annual dinner festivities will bring together more than 2,000 citizens, business leaders, and elected officials, making it one of the largest gala dinner events in the country. And everyone here tonight is lucky to be part of it, so let's begin. I ask you to please stand as it is time for the presentation of our nation's colors. Please turn your attention to the West Ballroom doors as we welcome the Fairchild Air Force Base Honor Guard to present the colors of the United States of America. Tonight, our Pledge of Allegiance will be led by one of WPC's Eastern Washington Advisory Board members and a Washington Policy Center young professional, Joed Groya. He's from Kennewick, Joed. Would you please join me in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Now please remain standing for our national anthem. We invite you to turn your attention to the area to the left of the stage and welcome the Spokane Area Youth Choir under the direction of Christina Plager and accompanied by Yi Chu Chen to perform the Star Spangled Banner. Thank you to the Spokane Area Youth Choir. Please remain standing as the color guard leaves the room. You may be seated. 
Tonight's invocation will be offered by a great friend of Washington Policy Center and a great friend of the many folks tonight here from Tri-Cities. She's the publisher of the Tri-Cities Journal of Business and a member of the WPC's Eastern Washington Advisory Board. Please welcome Melanie Hofer. Thanks, Robin. I'm honored to lead us in a moment of reflection. Blessed are you, Lord, God of creation, who gives us so many freedoms. Thank you for this amazing day. We gather here tonight ever grateful for our countless blessings, opportunities, and even our challenges. As we approach each new day, help us to know our true selves for who we are so we can know others for who they are. Help us to accept our true selves for who we are so we can accept others for who they are. Let us remember we need not think alike to love alike. Remind us we are all created in the image of love, and it is only love that makes compassion and true community possible. Bless all of us here as we join together in community to answer your prompts to stewardship, calls that promote life, liberty, and love. Spirit of love, please bestow upon all of us, especially those awarded our public trust, humble discernment as we work together to help each other. Let us use our skills and knowledge to work toward truth, understanding, and common good. Unite us in the reality of our humanity and help us bring our world closer to what you intended it to be, a place filled with grace, peace, and love. Amen. Thank you so much, Melanie. Well, there are many folks responsible for putting on this amazing event tonight, but it would not be possible without those who have sponsored the festivities. Our platinum sponsors tonight include Telect, Washington Trust Bank, Kent and Bonnie Clausen, Brown Bear Car Wash. Thank you to our platinum sponsors. Our gold and silver sponsors include Tippett Company, Wells Fargo, Dwayne Alton, Ann Coles, Sensky Lawn and Tree Care, and Breakthrough Incorporated. And our VIP table sponsors include Trans Systems, Larry Larison, Julie Shiflett. Plus, we have dozens and dozens of other table sponsors tonight, which are listed in your program. Please thank all of our sponsors for making this possible tonight. So who are all these people sitting in front of you? We will meet the men and women sitting at the head table starting to your left. Lisa and Chris Cargill. Uh, Chris is the Eastern Washington Director of the Washington Policy Center. You probably know the man sitting to his left, OWPC board member and former Congressman George Nethercutt. And isn't it nice to see him in person as well? Usually he's recorded. And uh, former Oklahoma Congressman J.C. Watts. On the other side of our tables, WPC Advisory Board member and President and CEO of the Tri-City Regional Chamber of Commerce, Lori Matson. Washington Policy Center Board Chairman Greg Porter. <laughs> Forbes columnist and best-selling author Amity Schles. <laughs> WPC President Dan Mead Smith. <laughs> and our Champion of Freedom Award recipient, Dr. Shelley Redinger of Spokane Public Schools. There are also dozens of elected officials joining us tonight, including Eastern Washington Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers, as well as the mayor of the city of Spokane, David Condon, if you would please stand, both of you. And if all other elected officials joining us would also please stand, it's a pretty big list. So if everyone else could stand and let us see who you are. That is a good group. All of the elected officials joining us are listed on the screens. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Greg Porter, chairman of the Washington Policy Center. Greg is a principal at Bernston Porter, a CPA firm in Bellevue. He has been on the board of directors at WPC since 2003 and is serving his fourth term as the chairman. He's proven to be a great leader for Washington Policy Center as it continues to grow and expand its impact all across our state. Greg? Thank you, Robin. 
Good evening, everybody. My name is Greg Porter. I'm a proud chairman of the Washington Policy Center. I'm a partner in the CPA firm Burnson Porter and Company in Bellevue, Washington. I went to uh, Washington State University like Dr. Renninger. I played football for the Cougars in the late 70s, early 80s. And I have to tell you, I have to tell you, when I stepped off the plane in Spokane this morning, I took a a breath of air, and I thought, God, I'm home. Uh, it felt really good. Uh, definitely, uh, definitely some clean air here. I'll tell you one quick story about Jim Walden, for those of you who know him. He's not a lot unlike our current coach, uh, and that he's quite a spectacle. But when I was uh, being recruited in the Bay Area, that's where I went to high school, and my, uh, my mother would, and my mother and father would go to all the games. My mother really didn't know she couldn't tell you offense from defense, but she was just a loyal supporter. She went to every single, every single game. And then as the season ended, these uh, head coaches from a variety of colleges wanted to come to the home, the family home, and meet the parents and kind of indoctrinate you into their program. And uh, when Jim Walden came to our home, I remember he rang the doorbell. We opened the door. It was my father, my mother, me, my two sisters. And, uh, and he, he, looks, uh, he looks up at the family. He says, hi, I'm Jim Walden from from Washington State University. And my mother, my mother looks at him and she goes, now Washington State, she goes, Washington State. She goes, they're in the six pack, right? <laughs> and, and he looks at her, he's biting his lip and he looks at her and he goes, ma'am, I, I, I promise you one thing, if he comes and plays for me, he won't be in the six pack too much. <laughs> so that's a good story on, uh, on Jim Walden and I never lived that one down. So, this is obviously an amazing night and a wonderful evening for the Washington Policy Center. Our, annu our annual dinner is one of the largest events like this in the country, and we're doing it right here in Spokane, so we couldn't be more proud. You know, why are you here? Why are the Washington, Washington Policy Center events so successful? Well, certainly we continue to have the best and most engaging speakers in the country, no doubt, but I truly believe, as I've, as I've watched uh, WPC grow over the years, that citizens, including our young people and our college students, you know, they're hungry and they're eager to get involved. Uh, they're looking for four things that we focus on in the Washington Policy Center. First of all, freedom, free markets, and personal responsibility working in tandem reduces the need for reliance on government. Balanced budget, lower taxes, less regulation provides an ecosystem for job growth, which is the lifeblood of our economy. Our magnificent environment and quality of life doesn't have to suffer at the expense of, a growing, of growing our economy if rational decisions are made with real data. And finally, making sure that all our school children are afforded the opp opportunity to learn and succeed. And that means making sure families have choices and educators can actually educate. This is why we're here year after year, and tonight, this is why we find ourselves in this room that's packed. Let me talk to you a little bit about our, our strategic plan with respect to marketing. There's about a million to a million and a half citizens, what we call civic-minded citizens, laying right in the middle of the political spectrum. They're not on the far left, they're not on the far right. These are the people we want to go after. These are the people that we want to engage with our intellectually and morally honest policy values, research, and ideas. And in our strategic plan, how do we do that? We do it three ways. We do it with demographics, geographics, and choice. Demographics. We start our young professionals group, an advisory board, and just launched our first college club at the University of Washington. We want to seize on the leaders of our state, the leaders of our next businesses, and this organization right when they enter their most, most formative years. And we're really looking hard also at starting another club at Washington State and Gonzaga University, so that's exciting. Geographics, four offices statewide. One in Olympia, Seattle on the west side, Spokane and Tri-Cities on the eastern side. And we're finally celebrating our fifth year uh, being on the eastern side of the state. So we couldn't be more happy about that because it is so important that this organization represents all the citizens of the state of Washington. Certainly, Eastern Washington is a huge part of that, and they have certain issues that are germane to them that we need to make sure we're addressing. Choice. We want to bring in that million to a million and a half people. We want to, they may have an affinity for one, one research center over another. They may, they may agree with us on our education issues, but not, not on our small business issues, or maybe they agree with us on our environment issues, but not on our transportation issues, and that's okay. That's okay, we wanna bring them into the organization, give them a choice. You can choose to support an individual center. So I talked a little bit, that's, that's input. Let's talk about output. You know, every, every organization is measured by their success, not their attempts. And I can tell you, we have, a, we have a litany of them. You know, the one thing I like about you guys compared to Seattle, you guys have good manners, you're actually listening. Okay, <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. You, I couldn't even talk over the group in Seattle. Um, 
either, you may be, at least you're not talking, you, you may not be listening. Um, our accomplishments, training aspiring leaders and incoming legislators on the inner workings of policy making and our research. That's really important that we have educated legislators. We write provocative, well received books and publications from healthcare to education and transportation. No on initiative 1098, 1098 no state income tax. Yes on privatization of liquor. Uh, passing charter schools, that's a personal, I mean, just, I mean, honor to be part of a group that had a major part in that. Uh, Two-thirds tax limitation on local levels, giving the voters uh, the final say in Spokane, and more recently in Yakima this last November. I mean, in fact, if you think about the headwind that we push up against, we passed 11 bills, 11 bills based on our research, our research and analysis, were signed into law by the governor during 2013 and 2014 legislative sessions, and our, posi our positions prevailed on five out of six ballot measures during the last general election. That is huge. <laughs> our research directors, these guys are rock stars. They were invited to testify before the legislature 14 times last year and before the United States Congress three times. I mean, that is absolutely huge. We're a state-based think tank, but we are gaining total national recognition. People are looking to us and the work that we've done to help solve the issues all across the country. We've had countless opinion editorials run in the Spokes and Review, Tri-City Herald, Yakima Herald, Seattle Times, and many more papers around the, uh, around the state. Also been featured for the first time on Fox News, Forbes.com, and the Washington Post. Our Environmental Center, Center Director, Todd Myers, began writing for the Wall Street Journal last year as an expert for energy and the environment, contributed eight articles so far this year, and has several more to, several more to follow before the end of the year. 1240, charter school follow-up project. It's one thing to pass this charter school initiative, initiative, it's another thing for it to be successful, and there's a lot of people, a lot of people that are pushing against that success. So we have an initiative to make sure, A, these charter schools are open, and B, they're gonna be successful. Uh, the first charter school was uh, open just recently in, in Seattle, but next year, right here, Pride Prep, uh, is gonna be opening next fall in Spokane. And we created our own quarterly news magazine, Viewpoint, which is in your packet, so take a look in there. Uh, and that's a real important issue with respect to getting the policy issues out to all the citizens. Okay, so we've been successful. Now you look at our strategic plan. I talked, talked a little bit about marketing. What about, uh, what about the impact going forward? Since we've been so successful, we're gonna really take some laser-like focus at a, at a few particular issues and make sure we get those issues uh, addressed in our state. And those are, we're going to recommend enacting a state constitutional amendment for tax limitation so we can stop voting on this every two years and not worry about the court overturning the people's will. <laughs> we're going to take our tax limitation uh, project across the state and even more counties and cities for them to implement. We're going to continue the charter school project, as I just mentioned, and that is a real important issue to us. And we're going to focus on moving into a right of work, the right to work state uh, for our state, so companies don't have to pass Washington State by when deciding where to locate. And anything that helps improve our business climate and, and, and create jobs in this state, we're going to take a hard look at. And that includes, that includes getting rid of our, our, our uh, state's estate tax. Um, so we can continue to pass businesses off to the next generation success. California, does, California doesn't even have an estate tax. Um, all right, so how can you help? You know, there's not a lot of foundations or organizations uh, that are contributing to public policy research and education organizations. Our, the support that we get comes from you in this room, you as individuals and your businesses. And so we look to you and implore you uh, to, to work with us and join our organization. If you look inside the packet that you've got, if you bypass this, the next thing under it is this. And what we'd like you to do is fill this out, sign up, you get six months free membership. You're going to get all the research and invitations to all the different events and learn a lot about the Policy Center. Now, for those of you that really want to play an important part in our organization, we have what's called the Pillar Society. This is, this is a, a plan that we started a couple years ago. 
where people make a three-year commitment to the organization, and that commitment starts at not less than $5,000, so $15,000 total over three years. And what that does is that enables you, you, you know, you're not gonna get nickel and dime throughout the year to sponsor this and come to this. You're part of the Pillar Society. Uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna be part of all the events. And based on the, depending on the level, as you go above 5,000, there's a lot of different perks uh, that, that, that you get as you continue up the, up the ladder in the Pillar Society, uh, including you know, tables at the annual dinner, you know, private member meetings, and functions with key elected officials. So far we have 60 members in that Pillar Society. And what that does for our organization is you know, we live and die on cash flow. It allows us to you know, determine with reasonable accuracy what we can expect in terms of support over rolling three-year periods. So it's so important and the work we're doing is so important. I, I ask everybody, please consider that. Uh, talk to Dan, talk to anybody in the Policy Center, talk to me, and we're happy to, happy to talk to you about that and how we might tailor make uh, your Pillar Society pledge and what that might look like for you and your family. In fact, we have several Pillar Society members here to, tonight and I'd like to uh, honor them and have them stand up. And please, please stand up, we'll clap at the end. Uh, Andre and Dwayne Alton, Robert Baker, Kent and Bonnie Clausen, Ann Coles, Mike George, Chris and Dar uh, Dalanin Patterson, Chris Sensky of Sensky Services, Bob Tippett of Tippett Company, Wayne and Trina Williams of Telec Telect Inc. If you guys could stand up. Thank you so much. <laughs> you wanna be in that group, trust me. Again, couldn't be more proud of our fifth anniversary here at the, in Eastern Washington, our office. It's hard to believe we've come so far in five years. You know, if you want to know the impact of what we're, what we're doing here, turn on your radio, watch your TV, read the newspaper, go online. WC's impact in Eastern Washington is clear. And we want to show you a quick video that highlights that even more. So go ahead. What does it take to have an impact? What does it take? to be leaders, and what does it take to be committed to Eastern Washington? Simply put, Washington Policy Center is committed to improving the lives of Washingtonians all across our state. As one of the largest state-based research organizations in the country, we have a statewide staff of 17 and offices in Spokane, Tri-Cities, Seattle, and Olympia. And our ideas and research are routinely used by both parties at the local, state, and federal levels. The work of the Washington Policy Center covers six research areas, education, environment, government reform, health care, transportation, and small business, with experts in each field producing high quality analysis. Citizens also depend on our legislative website, WashingtonVotes.org. Each year, WPC's ideas and recommendations become law. Our research is in the media more than five times a day in Washington State. It's Chris Cargill with Washington Policy Center filling in for Mike Fitzsimmons on this Thursday afternoon and we're talking about public charter schools. And the center organizes public events and conferences throughout the region. We want to welcome you this morning to our introduction and celebration of Eastern Washington's first public charter school. Including the highly successful annual dinner events in both Western and Eastern Washington. Five years ago, we decided to step up our commitment even more. That's when we decided to open our Eastern Washington office. Chris Cargill is with the Washington Policy Center, a nonpartisan. According to a report Keeper found from the Washington Policy Center, the Washington Policy Center thinks the trolley is too expensive. When we opened the Eastern Washington office, I don't think anyone expected us to be so successful so quickly. Well, it's actually quite remarkable. Since we opened the Eastern Washington offices, the number of WPC supporters in the region has more than tripled. You're always going to find us in different communities, speaking to groups, advancing positive ideas. We've expanded our health care, education, and annual dinner events to Spokane, and began holding our major solution summit in the Tri-Cities, which in 2013 featured pollster Scott Rasmussen. I'm, uh, I'm actually delighted to be here because of the name of this summit, a Solutions Summit. A recent survey of small business owners, in fact, showed we were one of the top sources for public policy information in eastern Washington, and our work is nowhere near complete. WPC is taking the lead on keeping eastern Washington involved in the legislative process. 
relocating the center's office of government reform to the Tri-Cities and calling for a common sense change, remote testimony. We've been doing it for years with our weekly wake up legislative forum from Wenatchee to Moses Lake. This really isn't a partisan issue, it's a fairness issue. I've had a good experience with the Washington Policy Center. I've been invited to be involved in several events, which I have appreciated, and I, I think that exchange is, is what is really necessary in order to get good public policy. Because of WPC, it now takes a broader consensus to raise taxes in Spokane and Yakima. The Washington Policy Center was extremely instrumental. Both city councils are now required to have a supermajority vote before they can raise the financial burden on their citizens. WPC has grown into what it is today because of the impact that it has. When our researchers and organizations speak, people listen. I get to see that firsthand here in Tri-Cities. The Washington Policy Center provides accurate, up-to-date information on the issues of the day, and I continue to value their great work. That's why I invited the Policy Center researchers to D.C. to testify before Congress. Five years ago, we asked you for your support. We are now asking you for your continued support. Because whether you're from Chelan, Walla Walla, Colville, or anywhere in Eastern Washington, WPC is there for you. Congratulations, Washington Policy Center. Congratulations, Washington Policy Center, on your five years in Eastern Washington. Congratulations, WPC. Keep up the great work. We need you now more than ever. You know, it's somewhat remarkable when you think what we've accomplished here in the last five years. Think about it like a startup company. You don't make any money the first year, maybe not the second year. But we hit the ground running here. I mean, we hit it running. And many of you in this room are a key part of that, and I want to thank you. Again, please consider joining our organization on any level. We'd love the Pillar Society, but just join on any level. And I swear, once you start getting associated with us, you're going to want to move into that Pillar Society. Um, our, exec, our director, Eastern Washington director, Chris Cargill, I, I got to tell you, there's probably not a better leader that we could have picked for this job. And all that he's accomplished in this short period of time, and I'm going to turn it over to Chris, our superstar. Well, thanks, everyone. Who knew this would be the easy part? Didn't think so. Uh, it's so great to have uh, so many of you here tonight to join with us to celebrate our five-year anniversary of our Eastern Washington office. Uh, first, um, I think it's important that we thank Dan and Greg for their leadership. Uh, if it weren't for these two gentlemen, we wouldn't have an Eastern Washington office. And so I just want to say thank you for all you've done for our organization. This is Greg's last year as board chair. So thank you, Greg. These two gentlemen are committed to Eastern Washington, I can tell you that uh, firsthand. And so we re really are lucky as an organization to have their leadership. As Greg was talking, it occurred to me that we have quite the uh, football panel up here. We have Dr. Redinger, we have Greg, we have Lori's daughter, all WSU folks on this side. Go ahead, go ahead. On this side, of course, we have Congressman Watts in uh, Oklahoma. My wife is an EWU grad, and George and I are Gonzaga grads, so football is all in our, in our blood up here. Now, I hear some of you snickering about Gonzaga. And let me just remind everyone in this room that the Gonzaga football program has been undefeated since the 1950s, okay? No other program on this panel can say that. This event obviously is a tremendous undertaking. Uh, it takes months of meticulous planning, a lot of sleepless nights, including last night and the night before that and the night before that. I kind of feel like uh, Alan Alden, the, um, one of the final episodes of The West Wing, his character had just lost the presidential election. He called up his secretary a couple of days after and he said, okay, what's on my schedule for tomorrow? And she said, well, you have a haircut at one o'clock. And he said, okay, what else? And she said, that's it. And so I'm kind of wondering what's on my agenda for tomorrow because I already got my haircut last weekend. Uh, our success in Eastern Washington is due to our Eastern Washington Advisory Board members. It is not due to me. I push things around. I 
I try to uh, make sure that we're as, as visible in the community as possible, but if it weren't for our Eastern Washington Advisory Board members, we would not be in the position that we're in today. So if all of them would please stand, there is a list in all of your programs. Go ahead, please stand. We all know who you are. These are the men and women who are responsible for our successes in Eastern Washington, so I thank them very much. There are two Eastern Washington Advisory Board members who I particularly want to recognize because of the role they played in this event. And they, actually three, I should say, they are responsible for bringing more than 20 tables to this event, 20 of the tables that you're sitting at. They are Wayne Williams, Ann Coles, and Mike Polson. These three are responsible for 20 of the 86 tables that are in this room this evening. So thank you all very much. For those of you who don't know, we have our office in Eastern Washington, not only in the Tri-Cities, but also in the Greater Spokane Incorporated building, the Spokane Regional Business Center in downtown Spokane. Greater Spokane Incorporated has been a great partner with us. Uh, Rich Hadley, the former CEO of Greater Spokane Incorporated, of course, was a great partner with us. He has retired, but uh, Steve Stevens has taken his place, and I believe he is here this evening. Steve, would you stand? Where is he? There he is, Steve. Thank you very much. We're looking forward to our relationship uh, with Greater Spokane Incorporated for many, many years to come. Ladies and gentlemen, we are committed to Eastern Washington. Were that not so, I would not be standing here tonight. And I say that not only as the Eastern Washington, or Eastern Washington director, but as a sixth generation Eastern Washingtonian who grew up here in Spokane, graduated from Central Valley High School. I would not be part of an organization that did not pay attention to and did not care about Eastern Washington and the issues that we have going on here in Eastern Washington. So I would ask you to join with us if you're not already a supporter of Washington Policy Center. As Greg said, there are easy ways to do that. Inside all of your folders are the donation cards. You can sign up if you'd like to contribute. It's tax deductible. If you'd like to sign up to become a six-month member and, uh, and come to more of our events, we'd love to have you do that as well. And don't forget, inside all of your folders is also a gold piece of paper it's our Eastern Washington annual dinner uh, survey. That is almost as critical as the donation card because that helps us plan next year's event. And so we would ask all of you, while you're filling out your card to uh, sign up for Washington Policy Center, to take the time to fill out that survey and let us know what we did right, what we did wrong, and let us know if we should continue to do the event the way we're doing it. I think many of you uh, support the way that we're doing the event, as uh, is evidenced here tonight by more than 700 of you in the room, but there's always things that we can do better. So I would invite you to tell us what we could do better so we can uh, change it up and, and provide you an even better experience each and every year. There are three big issues. Greg touched on two of them, the charter school issue and Pride Prep here in Spokane that's gonna be opening. The first charter school in Eastern Washington will be opening up right here in Spokane. Brenda McDonald, the uh, principal and CEO of that uh, new charter school is here with us at the Spokane Public School table. And then, of course, we are recognizing the efforts of Dr. Redinger here this evening. Jason touched on this issue in the video, and that is this issue of remote testimony. Now, how many of you believe we'd already be doing remote testimony if the capital of Washington State were in eastern Washington? I am one of those. <laughs> What do we mean by remote testimony? We mean giving you the ability to participate in the legislative session without having to travel across the pass in the middle of winter, without having to spend $300 or $400 on an airplane ticket, without having to stay overnight in Olympia and then be told you get one minute to testify. That's something that we should not be allowing in the home of Microsoft we should be allowing the citizens of this state to offer their opinions to their legislative leaders wherever they are in this state, not just in the Puget Sound region. And so, that is one of our top projects right now. And Jason Mercier and myself have met with members of the legislature to try to convince them to allow Eastern Washingtonians and those all over the state to participate in the legislative session via remote testimony. What does that mean? That means you would be able to 
testify before a legislative committee by simply going to Spokane Falls Community College or Spokane Community College or Columbia Basin down in the Tri-Cities. It's something that we should have been doing a long time ago and something that Washington Policy Center is pushing forward on as we speak. We talked about the two-thirds issue. Thank you to all of you in this room who helped uh, with the effort to educate the public on the supermajority requirement for tax increases. This is not necessarily about stopping tax increases. This is about having a broader discussion about the financial burden that is placed on all of you. We think at the very least, there should be a broader discussion about that financial burden. So again, we invite you to join us, contribute to the organization, come to our events, and I hope to see you along the road. And I will be back later in the program. I noticed I was left out of that football discussion. I have my first ever fantasy team. I drafted my first round draft with Adrian Peterson. That's pretty much set in the tone. <laughs> so I need a running back. So I might pick up Congressman Watts' son who plays for the Rams. Who you, that used to be my team. I am from St. Louis originally. Long, long, long time ago though. It is time to begin hearing from our dinner speakers. To introduce Amity Schles, please welcome up the president of the Tri-City Regional Chamber of Commerce, Lori Matson. Lori's leadership has turned the Tri-City Regional Chamber into one of the best in the state of Washington. She was an integral part of WPC's effort to open offices in Eastern Washington, specifically in the Tri-Cities. And she's also a member of WPC's Eastern Washington Advisory Board. Lori. Thank you and good evening. Thank you, Dan and Chris and Jason and everyone here at Washington Policy Center, and congratulations on this incredible crowd you've brought here. Each year, I and so many others from the Tri-Cities really look forward to attending this event, and I'm truly honored to be asked to introduce our keynote speaker, Amity, Amity Schles. Amity Schles has authored several New York Times bestsellers, The Forgotten Man, A New History of the Great Depression, Coolidge, a full-length biography of the 30th president, and The Greedy Hand, How Taxes Drive Americans Crazy. National Review called The Forgotten Man the finest history of the Great Depression ever written. The Economist made Coolidge an editor's choice in 2013. Ms. Schles is under contract to write The Silent Majority, a third volume of the 20th century. Amity Schles chairs the board of the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation, her passion, a national foundation based in Plymouth Notch, Vermont, the birthplace of President Coolidge. The foundation's goal is to bring Americans to Coolidge, to bring Coolidge to America. Ms. Schles is the 2009 winner of the Hayek Prize current and currently chairs the jury for this prize, sponsored by the Manhattan Institute. She has twice been a finalist for the Loeb Prize in Commentary. In 2002, she was winner of the Frederick Bastille Prize, an international prize recognizing journalists whose public works explain, promote, and defend principles of the free society. In 2003, she was a J.P. Morgan Fellow for Finance and Economy at the American Academy in Berlin. She is the current director of the 4% Growth Project at the George W. Bush Institute. You may be familiar with Amity Schles from the Wall Street Journal, where she served as editorial board writing on foreign policy and taxation and other topics. Or perhaps you've read her syndicated columns in the Financial Times and Bloomberg. Currently, Ms. Schles appears in Forbes and the National Review. A magna cum laude graduate of Yale University, Ms. Schles is married to fellow journalist and editor Seth Lipsky. The Lipskys have four children. Please help me welcome our esteemed speaker, Amity Schles. What a wonderful evening. What an impressive group. Every think tank on the East Coast envies you. It's, it's very, very um, stunning to be here and, and see all this and to see your commitment, the commitment of this group to policy changes, how serious you are. Uh, I'm going to dispense with, with, with um, a lot of introduction and just plunge in as if 
uh, we were looking at the television together. Um, and when you look at the television, Jason Mercier and I were talking about this on the way over. What do you see? There's an election coming, midterms right, and uh, uh, right pretty soon. And, and everyone is asking, should the government spend? And the answer comes in a very broad range. The answer to the question, should the government spend, is either yes or yes a lot, right? And, and Jason was saying that's also true in Washington. That is, our assumption is that government cannot not spend. Uh, and then you want to ask, well, what premises underlie that assumption? Who are we? And the first is, well, you know, you've heard it before. The government has to spend for the economy to grow. Right? You've heard that? Mm. And the second is that the United States, or even a state, uh, cannot get someone who is opposed to spending a naysayer elected, right? Or, or that once elected, a naysayer will stop saying no. And if he does say no too much, well, he's going to get de-elected, right? That's what we think. Even, even uh, President Ronald Reagan did not spend less in office, did he? Right? So is it, is it possible, and my job tonight, and a busy night for you, an important night, is to give you a little context. And in these remarks, I really just say one thing. It is possible for an American leader to say no. And to keep saying no, and not to hurt the economy, and get elected on no. The president who did that, and I went back to research to find him, was Calvin Coolidge, the 30th president of the United States, who served in the 1920s. Again, I'll say he did get elected. You know, he came in as president because Warren Harding died, but he was elected on his own and so handsomely in 1924. Now, I can hear a little bit of a, uh, it might be like football, a little bit of contemptuous cackle about certain presidents or certain teams, right? Um, and you know stories about Coolidge. Uh, I bet he's not in a lot of school books, right? Not very much. He's certainly not in the recent uh, great big series about the Roosevelts that Ken Burns did on PBS. Some of you may have watched, right? Um, you heard maybe that he was a sour face, that he didn't show his teeth. Right? Well, he had bad teeth, it's true, they didn't have, right? Okay. Didn't show his teeth. Uh, he was, Coolidge was a skinny guy, oh, excuse me, he was called uh, an accident of an accident. That's not very nice, right? Uh, Alice Roosevelt Longworth, the daughter of another kind of president, Theodore Roosevelt, said that Coolidge looked as though he'd been weaned on a pickle. So that's about what we learned uh, of Coolidge. Uh, what I discovered in this book was that he's worth knowing a lot more about. If he were a stock, I was telling some of your friends tonight, Coolidge would be a buy. That's how mispriced he is. That's the disparity between his reputation and his true value. If you want to know one thing about Coolidge, it's that he served in the White House for 67 months. And I know that Congressman Watts will especially appreciate this, um, from 1923 to 1929, and when he left office, the federal budget was actually lower than when he came in. You kind of say, well, is that real amity or is that nominal, right? Real and nominal. Actually, they had deflation both ways. He actually cut it. Second thing Coolidge did, not to be too rude to President Reagan, um, he cut the top marginal rate on the income tax to 25%. And as you probably know, that's lower than the 28% that we achieved in our country with Ronald Reagan and Democrats together. And what happened then? There were more patents than just about any other decade. There, the unemployment was 
below 5%, right? Um, there was no inflation, in fact, deflation, I mentioned that. And uh, the growth, uh, uh, um, Lori mentioned I did work with President Bush on the 4% growth project. That project was slightly aspirational, right? Because we don't have 4% growth. Coolidge had 4% real growth. So all these things are going on. Um, so I, he, if he was a Scrooge, a sour face, he was a Scrooge who begat plenty. Um, a forgotten president who did it, by the way, uh, George Nethercutt, very civilly who roll back regulation, the hero you never knew you had. Um, how he did it, and actually with some help from the president who came before him, President Harding, how he said no is, and begat plenty is a really good story. And again, I'll say it's a story partly of political process, partly of people and their moods, their personality, their temperament. What matters in a leader? Temperament, right? The character, right? It takes a couple minutes to tell, which is why I'm grateful to the Washington Policy Center. And now I will mention President Dan and, let's see, Chairman Greg Porter and Chris Cargill, Cargill and to you tonight for the, for the chance to tell it all the way out here. Such an East Coast guy, but he's yours too. Okay, so my story starts uh, after a big crisis, right? You've heard of that. Oh, we've had a big crisis. Um, it was 1920 then, or 1921, or 1919, and the parallels do emerge before your eyes when you look at this um, era. There had been a, a big disruption. In our case, it was the financial crisis. In their case, it was World War I, a very important industry. It had a lot of trouble. Uh, they had um, the, the great internet of their era was the railroads and utilities, and the railroads had been, let's see, in the war they had been nationalized and then denationalized, if you can imagine the business disruption. The country was taking a little bit long to get over the crisis. Uh, certain sectors were doing just fabulously, such as energy. That sounds familiar, but maybe other businesses were not doing as well. And, and that unemployment was troubling. There was a sense of uneven recovery and that nobody knew what policy the government would apply next. Unions were part of this story, as they are now. In fact, um, you probably know that Washington State has a big union history story from this period. In 1919, there was actually a general strike to shut down Seattle, and the mayor, who was not a Republican like this room, Ole Larson, said, I can't handle this. This is not good for Seattle. I will balk this Bolshevik experiment. That's what he called it, and stopped it. Unions were doing that all over America, a lot of disruption, looking uh, to Europe. Uh, and one person Larson actually inspired was a governor in Massachusetts, Calvin Coolidge, who had a police strike in Boston. But the police in Boston were very compelling. They were much loved. They were indeed underpaid, right? Their horses loved them and whinnied after them, just like in a Budweiser commercial. But they went on strike and walked off their jobs, and there was chaos in Boston, and the governor at that time, Coolidge, had to call in the National Guard and so he fired the policeman. And Coolidge said in a telegram to the AFL, to Sam Gompers, a famous line, there is no right to strike against the public safety by anybody, anywhere, any time. Very, very tough decision, but did inspire um, a lot of us, including later Reagan. So all this is going on, a lot of disruption, and the debt has gone up a whole bunch of times. That's like now, too. And taxes are all already rather high in the 70s. So how's the government going to get more money, with, even though the debt and the deficit are exploding? And two groups, at least in this period, are pressing on the government to say, yes, seeking entitlements, or what we would call entitlements. The first was the farmers. And you remember, in this period, they were a lot more numerous as constituents than they are now. Uh, they wanted a regular subsidy. 
and they had a case. Well, farming prices were going down, commodity prices were going down sharply. You know about this. The second group seeking a yes and entitlement were veterans. And again, you say veterans, they're powerful, but how numerous are they? They were incredibly numerous after World War I because there had been universal conscription in World War I. And remember, in World War I, there were no antibiotics. So the many who came home, maybe even as many as a quarter disabled, were in pain with the prospect of being in pain or disabled to the end, and they wanted something from the government. That sounds good, right? Sounds reasonable. But the question was, could the government afford it? It sort of felt like the government, Washington, would say yes. So the first surprise in my story, the way it starts to get interesting in 1920, is that one party happens to be the Republican Party actually runs on a ticket of no. Well, there's the leader, the presidential candidate, Warren Harding, an ebullient senator from Ohio. He says, no entitlements, no more, we're going to cut. And then his sidekick, the vice presidential candidate, Calvin Coolidge, that governor from Massachusetts who did it with the unions, who, who shut down the unions, and that was the way they presented. And they said, we're going to say no, and we're going to live no with our whole entire bodies. We're going to show America we can make the government smaller. Remember, prohibition was on in this period, right? So they had to live quietly in the White House if they were going to ask the country to live quietly. Their campaign logo, and this you will see in the AP history program, is was, remember this, normalcy? You're like, I remember learning that in high school. Normalcy, that doesn't sound very good. They were dull cogs, right? Harding and Coolidge, they wanted us all to be normal. Who wants to be just normal, right? Um, but when I went back to research this book, I found that by normalcy, they, uh, Harding came up with the term. He meant something slightly different. He said, we want a business environment with less regulation, a calm, common sense business environment that's normal so we can have fun and start companies. Well, that's very different, right? It begins to sound attractive. And Coolidge was quite a stickler for the English language, sort of a teacher, a lawyer, right? He didn't like that word normal, see, sounded like it might mix Latin and Greek to him. So he had another way of putting what the Republican Party sought that year. He said, we need less economic uncertainty. Oh, that's, that begins to sound familiar too, right? Second novelty, these no-sayers win. Oh my gosh, right? So you get the president, Harding, and the bookkeeper, his vice president, they come in. And maybe if some of you did watch the Roosevelt's this week, the Roosevelt's is all about jumping into the presidency and owning it, right? The bully pulpit, right? And changing America through the presidency. Um, you know, T Theodore Roosevelt said, let's get action. That, that's what he wanted. So I wanted to read to you from Warren Harding's inaugural address because this address will strike you as a little bit different from what presidents of either party might say today when they get inaugurated. So forgive me, I'm gonna pretend I'm Warren Harding, okay? Are you ready? No altered system will work a miracle. Any experiment will add to confusion. Our best assurance lies in efficient administration of our proven system. Oh, right, not a lot of change in there, right? Very square. And President Harding, who was the first one in, did say no in office a lot. He worked with the Senate and passed an important law, the Budget and Accounting Act of 1921. I know you care a lot about budget and budget initiatives. You're right. Laws matter. And this law gave the executive an authority that sounds kind of useful. It gave him the authority to sequester, impound. Oh, you got an appropriation and you got two battleships, two pencils. I see you're using 1.5. I'll take my half battleship back. I'll take my pencil stub back, the executive might say. 
Very interesting. Harding said no to farmers. He cut taxes down from the 70s to the 50s. He um, pursued a privatization effort of excess oil reserves that sound like something the Reason Foundation might come up with. Very virtuous, right? And, but um, you know what, what's coming. Um, what about the vets? Well, he wasn't going to give them an entitlement. He said no, but he would build the hospitals for them. That was his compromise, and he created a head of the Veterans Bureau to run that. But you remember what I said about temperament, right? Harding was a complicated man, President Harding. His party said no, his plan said no, his mind said no, but his heart said yes. Right? Very lovable guy. And after his first round of cutting and all that in 1922 and 1923, Harding kind of rested, right? He got tired in the office. Prosperity had already come. He got tired of tax cutting. Maybe 50% top rate was okay. He got tired of appearing upright. He got tired of keeping appearances. He liked parties, President Harding, right? Remember I said prohibition was on, and then all of a sudden in the newspaper said people are going to the White House for quote unquote food and action. Oh, what's that supposed to mean, right? Um, and he liked to appoint his friends, and two of those appointments were fatal. You know these stories because of the region you lived in. One involved that oil reserve privatization, that libertarian uh, project. Uh, his campaign friends got too involved, so instead of worthy privatization, it became known as Teapot Dome, right? The scandal. And the vet story is even worse. The man that Harding put in charge to make hospitals for all the poor veterans, Charles Forbes, a friend, turned out to be so corrupt, he ended up in Leavenworth. Ooh. So that meant the vets didn't always get the hospitals, right? That's bad. And some people thought voters should have recognized that Harding wasn't a follow-through guy in the first place. Um, one was his father, and I'm going to tell you actually a slightly risque joke, and you'll get it, even though our kids might not get it, um, about President Harding. He said um, the country should have known earlier that Harding would say yes um, all the time. Uh, because it was a good thing Warren wasn't a girl, because if he were a girl, he'd always be in the family way. That was pretty tough, right, to say it about your son, but that gives you a feel for the period. And as you know, Harding died in the summer of 1923, and his vice president Coolidge came in. Another year, you'll get Harding's defender here, the Harding revisionist, but I'm going to proceed with Coolidge. Very sad death, right? New president. And people, you're clever. You like politics. You're counting the election month. Summer 1923. Oh, how much? Only a year or something till the real presidential election. Lame duck, right? Coolidge is going to be a lame duck. But remember, again, temperament. Where Harding was divided. His heart was divided. Coolidge was all one. His plan said no. His mind said no, and his heart said no. He was like an accountant, right? Like CP, right? He was just built that way, like all those occupational tests. Um, he picked a budgeting vice president, later Charles Dawes. He picked budget people around him. He was determined to cut, really determined how determined. Well, right down to the pets, right down to the White House animals. You know what the White House names its animals, all these fun names, right? Mrs. Beasley, Bo, Barney, Sox, right? That wasn't satisfactory to the Coolidge White House. A, a South African mayor sent the Coolidges a pair of lion cubs for pets. And what do you suppose President Coolidge named those lion cubs? Tax Reduction and Budget Bureau. <laughs> oh. And, and the names tell you well, some nuances. They expose some nuances in his fiscal policy. He wasn't a pure supply sider. It wasn't like he had one big fat lion called tax cut and a little bitty runt called budget bureau, right? No, he had steak to feed them and he kept them the same weight. Budget, tax, right? Can't cut the taxes unless you reduce the budget. Very traditional budgeting. We call it austerity. But he believed in it, even Stephen. 
And I'm going to read you now some Coolidge lines because people thought he would come on week and he didn't. Okay, I'm going to be Calvin Coolidge. I am for economy, and after that, I am for more economy. Mm -mm, that's a little scary, right? Like a teacher, and he says, we must have no carelessness in our dealing with public property or the expenditure of public money. Such a condition is characteristic of undeveloped people. Ooh, right? And they could see he was disciplined. He vowed to execute what he and Harding had promised. In this way, he's like Lyndon Johnson, and do it even better in a way. He said, I promise to do this to perfection, this program. Taxes, oh, 50% range, that's too high. He and the Treasury Secretary, Andrew Mellon, they were going to cut it down. They cut it down. They cut it down. And when you look at the tax charts in the Tax Foundation, you say, this wasn't that hard. By 1925, they got a pretty low rate, maybe even 1924. But when you look at the asterisk, you'll see something interesting. The tax cuts of 24 and 25 were actually made law only in 1926. Ooh, a novelty. Retroactive tax cuts. Wow. We don't have that anymore, right? We just have efforts at retroactive tax increases. Very principled. Um, Mellon called what they were doing scientific taxation. He was much closer, closer to a supply side or budget. This was an amazing display by Coolidge. You know with your children how hard it is to say no when you're unprepared, right? They, Dad, I need the car, right? Coolidge met every week with his budget director right before the cabinet meeting so he knew your business people how to say no when he did say no in the meeting. I quantified these for the book, the research about Coolidge, and I found that he met with his tax advisor, the budget director, 50 times a year. Nobody gets to see the president, maybe the first lady, 50 times a year. That's an incredible display of professional discipline. Um, of course, the cabinet members got all tired of what he was doing because after a while they couldn't cut anymore. The economy was going fast. He created a 3% club for the department that cut the budget 3% extra and, they got, and that department got what? A sticker, right? And then he created a 2% club after a few years if you managed to cut your budget an extra 2% beyond what was asked. And then they couldn't do that anymore and they created a 1% club. And since he was a New Englander and a forest man, he created a woodpecker club for the department that pecks away at its budget here and there. He also cut budgets of the future by vetoing laws. That's, he called taxes, legalized larceny. He wrote to his father even before the presidency, and this I know some of you lawmakers have thought about this, it is better to kill a bad law than pass a good one. Hmm. Um, Harding had vetoed only six times. Coolidge vetoed 50. I know the lawmakers in the room uh, will guess what Coolidge's favorite legislative device, executive device was. That too has to do with temperament. It was the pocket veto. Why? Well, you sort of have to trick them into passing the law right before the holiday, and then wham, you veto it. Uh, in, in the presidential recess, in the congressional recess, right? And you, what's so great about the pocket veto? One, you don't have to write any message with it, mm, and it cannot be overridden. They have to get a whole new law together. Very efficient, right? Ve very tough. Coolidge wasn't just good at the pocket veto. He was a regular Isaac Stern of the pocket veto, a virtuoso of this, this tool. People came at him to try and get him to sign laws, you know, sign legislation, looking for his weak spots. He came from this farming town. His farming town, his father had a cheese factory. What is a cheese factory in the period before refrigeration? It is an exercise in farming desperation, right? You want to get your milk to the place, but the train doesn't come to you and you have no fridge. Cheese, right? His town was a nominally a farming town, but um, the agriculture department came later to this farm hamlet and wrote that not a single acre of his town, Plymouth Notch, was arable. So they suspected Coolidge would sign farming legislation funding. Nope. What, I mean, nope. When the approach came to Coolidge, he said, 
Silence, right? He was always silent. Well, farmers never have made much money. Pause. Don't suppose they ever will. Pause. Don't suppose there's much we can do about it. Pause. Very unusual man. He loved farms. He thought they were important, but he didn't want to exaggerate their economic prospects through subsidy. Ooh, interesting. You think um, the other congressmen like this? I mean, the other Washington people, not particularly, right? And you, you think about when people visit the White House, right? That's always a privilege. Whatever party the president is, yours or another's, you go, right? Right? It's like the MasterCard commercial. See the president in a big room like this? Real good. See the president in a small group? Even better. See the president at his own breakfast table with his own bacon and maple syrup from his own town, just you and him? Priceless, right? But curiously, the congressman in Coolidge's era didn't think it was priceless after a while because they, they didn't, they didn't want to go to the White House anymore. He said no so much. And there was an usher at the White House who didn't like President Coolidge. He was not a very good tipper, right? Um, and that usher, Ike Hoover, kept a list of the RSVB knows the excuses people gave rather than breakfast at their president's breakfast table. And I'm going to read a couple of them to you, OK? Just for the humor. Senator Heflin, no, I can't come, regrets, sick. <laughs> Senator Pittman, regrets, sick. Se and here, this one is really pathetic. Senator Reed of Missouri, regrets, sick friend. <laughs> but the best one from this region, Senator Norris, unable to locate, <laughs> wouldn't come at all. And eventually, you know, it, it was tough. But I want to say some in Washington recognized what Coolidge was doing finally. One was Walter Lippmann, the journalist. And I'm going to read to you what Lippmann wrote about Coolidge. This White House, strange White House, is extremely sensitive to the first symptom of any desire on the part of Congress or the executive departments to do something. The skill with which Mr. Coolidge applies his wet blanket is technically marvelous. There has never been Mr. Coolidge's equal in the art of deflating interest. The naive statesman imagines it's desirable to interest the people in their government that indignation at evil is useful. But Mr. Coolidge is more sophisticated. He has discovered the value of diverting attention from government and with an exquisite subtlety that amounts to genius, he has used dullness and boredom as political device. <laughs> Woo! And the voters recognized him. Coolidge's uh, competition in 24 was extremely tough. There was a strong third party running. We know what happens when third parties run strong and get 17% of the vote, right? We've heard of Ross Perot. Well, um, usually that's not good for Republicans, right? When, when that happens, especially uh, when the third party kind of comes out of the Republican Party. Well, they had a third party, the progressives, that got 17% of the vote. And yet Coolidge, the Republican, took an absolute majority, meaning the Democrats and the progressives combined. The voters understood. They saw it. And you know, the Republican Party is a neurotic animal, even then it was. And when Coolidge chose not to run, like J.C. Watts, right, the party had a nervous breakdown. Because they knew that they could never get anybody like Coolidge. When Hoover ran, who was, he was an entirely different type, he ran promising to continue Coolidge policy. He didn't, but that's another story. So what are your takeaways tonight? I mean, for you, uh, one is that presidential temperament matters. Two is that laws, your initiatives, his laws matter a lot. Um, that Budget and Accounting Act really helped executives, weak or strong, Harding, Coolidge, and so on. A third is that respect for federalism, for states matters. You can't fight Washington just to fight it. You have to know what you're fighting for, right? 
And what you're fighting for is the area of the states, the authority of another kind of government, the authority of the individual. Coolidge wasn't just a federalist, he was a ferocious federalist. He actually said the United States, always referred to it in plural, the United States are. Um, and he wrote, the United States are inviolate insofar only as Arizona or any other given state is inviolate. He wasn't just a political case for federalism, he lived it. His was a moral case. I would add to here that his faith mattered very much. Again, what, what's wrong with big government? What does it infringe upon? The authority of the states, but also the private sphere, the sphere of the individual and of the spirit. He spoke very often of things of the spirit, and he said that material objects from government cannot help there, right? That, 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 that there's no help with that, that we also have to turn to ourselves, to our communities, to our God, to our faith, to our family. And quite explicitly he said that his writing is beautiful. Perseverance matters, that's a big one. You think you just started, keep going, he didn't give up. No saying can be good for the economy is the last. Um, they, they had very strong growth, I mentioned that before. The, especially vis-a-vis -vis the unions, it, there was big progress. When the unions drew back, the economy grew and wages rose. In the 20s, union membership got down. The supply side experiment worked, that's what it was. They got more revenue than they ever expected when they cut rates. Scrooge can win elections. I will close now and just add one last thing. History matters. I told you all this story, we do it at the Coolidge Foundation, I'm sure you do it here. Why does it matter? Because we need courage to do the things we do. And once we know that it has happened before and someone else was brave and got pretty far, that encourages us. If our children don't know that, they can't take the lesson either, which is why, Ms. Redinger, that's so important, what you're doing with the charter schools, to be sure that message is conveyed of what actually happened in the past, right? You won't find all this in the AP history format book. Uh, you're gonna say, uh, did Coolidge cause the Great Depression? I'll just say no, monosyllabically. And you're gonna say, can this happen again? Uh, and in a speech about no, I am going to turn around and say, yes, I believe it can. There can be another candidate, another politician like Coolidge there already are. Thank you very much. Amity, thank you so much. Our VIPs tonight, as well as our top sponsors, have received a copy of Amity's book, Coolidge, and you can get a copy as well. They will be on sale in the lobby at the conclusion of tonight's dinner, and Amity will be happy, I'm speaking for her, to uh, autograph a copy for you. We're gonna take a short break, so continue to enjoy your dessert, and we will be back shortly with the Spokane Area Youth Choir, who will favor us with a terrific selection, Homeland. After that, we will be able to recognize our Champion of Freedom Award winner and hear from Congressman Watts. In the meantime, enjoy your company.
Thank you so much to the Spokane Area Youth Choir for their performance here this evening. What a treat. It is time to recognize our Jennifer Dunn Thompson Scholarship Award winner. To do that, let me turn over the podium to WPC President Dan Mead Smith. All right. Well, this is the time for our two, or three actually, our three highest awards at the Washington Policy Center. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you our 2014 Jennifer Dunn Thompson Scholarship recipient. This is Washington Policy Center's fourth year presenting this scholarship to a female college student in our state that embodies the former Congresswoman's leadership's characteristics. For those of you that may not remember or know new Jennifer Dunn Thompson, uh, one of our states and nation's great leaders. She was elected in 1992 to Congress after serving as chairwoman of the state Republican Party for a number of years. Major accomplishments in Congress, including getting rid of the estate tax for a period of time. Um, also, the, the, the amber alert system that you now see throughout our highway system was Jennifer Dunn's bill. She rose up into leadership to be one of the highest ranking women ever in leadership in Congress, was the first woman to run for House Majority Leader, and served our state and her district in Western Washington, the 8th District, uh, incredibly well. She um, retired in 2004 from Congress after a great 12-year career, and we, the Washington Policy Center, gave her our Champion of Freedom Award in 2005. She unexpectedly passed away two years later in 2007, and her estate wanted to continue Jennifer's working with women and future leaders and set up a scholarship program, uh, which we were honored to be part of at the Washington Policy Center. So her late husband, Keith Thompson, set up the Jennifer Dunn Thompson Scholarship. And as I mentioned, this is the fourth year we've been honored to uh, award this to an up-and-coming female leader. We received a record number of applicants this year, but one stood out, Stephanie George. Stephanie is from Moxie, which is right outside of Yakima. She's a Washington State University student, continuing our theme tonight, studying agricultural and food business economics with a minor in political science. Her parents, who are with us here tonight, are small business owners in Moxie that stressed from an early age the importance of the private sector and free market principles. And she, at her young age, is a small business owner herself, along with her younger sister of a, gro of a goat breeding company the use that they've used to pay for their college education at Wazoo. She plans to attend law school after graduation from Washington State and pursue a career in agricultural policy. Our previous Jennifer Dunn Thompson Scholarship recipients have used their $5,000 scholarship to pay for tuition, which we think is great. But the other option, which Stephanie chose, is to use it to cover expenses to intern back in Washington, D.C. to get incredible experience on Capitol Hill. So we're excited to announce that she'll be interning for your local congresswoman, Kathy McMorris Rogers, in her Washington, D.C. office next spring, and I think she'll She'll be a great asset to, to Kathy's office and come back with even more leadership skills. So Stephanie, if you want to come up. It's my pleasure to award our 2014 scholarship to Stephanie George and we're doing this, and what our plaque reads is for proudly reflecting the leadership, commitment to public service, and personal values of Jennifer Dunn Thompson, for representing the bright promise of a rising generation, and for exemplifying the talent, hard work, and willingness to carry Jennifer's ideals into the future. Presented at the Washington Policy Center's dinner tonight in Spokane, and she'll be with us again next week in Bellevue. Congratulations, Stephanie.
Stephanie, congratulations. Well, tonight we have the opportunity to also recognize a public school reformer with WPC's Champion of Freedom Award to introduce her. Please welcome WPC Eastern Washington Director Chris Cargill. Good evening once again. Just a reminder to get those red envelopes moving around your tables. Initiative 1240 was passed in 2012 by Washington voters, making Washington the 42nd state in the country to allow for public charter schools. Washington Policy Center, of course, is very proud of its role in bringing public charter schools to Washington State. Back in 2011, January of 2011, we published this study, which many of you may have had the chance to read, called An Option for Learning, which described the real benefits of allowing charter schools in Washington State. The study kicked off a series of events that led to the passage of this initiative, and now we are one of the states that allows for public charter schools. Quite an accomplishment. Tonight, we'd like to share with you a short video that explains exactly what charter schools are and highlights some of the new charter schools that are going to be opening. So please turn your attention to the screens. At the Washington Policy Center, we are so excited about charter schools and what they're going to be doing for K-12 education. Charter schools give administrators powerful new tools, they give teachers freedom and flexibility that they need, and most importantly, they improve learning for students. What is a charter school? A charter school is a community-based public school that operates independently of central district management and administrative rules. Charter schools allow local educators to offer innovations in school staffing, scheduling, educational programs, and in the use of technology. One of the first charter schools to open in our state will open in the Spokane School District in August of 2015. Spokane Public Schools is one of a number of districts throughout the nation that is starting a portfolio approach. And so we have a number of options for parents and families. So charter is one more option within our portfolio. And families are really looking for that, especially this generation of, of parents and families. They're looking for more individualized learning, um, a balance of blended learning, which is more technology integrated into the classroom. So we're STEM school, which is a science, technology, engineering, and mathematics school. Our students take twice as much math and science. They have a, a tablet or a computer with them all day long, and they're learning computer science and engineering within their coursework so that our students are really well prepared for entering into college and pursuing STEM degrees, if that's what they choose. Each new public charter school will be tuition-free and open to all students and will focus on serving low-income and disadvantaged families in each community. The very first public charter school to open in our state is First Place Scholars Charter School in Seattle, which serves homeless children and their families. We're extremely excited about the prospect of becoming a charter school. We will close and reopen and have our first students as a charter school this coming September 2014. We do have a reputation and we have a, a track record of bringing a level of support and stability to our families that no one else can rival. This school represents a way to help our kids rise up out of poverty, do better than the last generation, which has always been the goal for many of our families, it's a way for our kids to stop falling through the cracks, and it can be, I believe, it can be replicable. From SOAR Academy in Tacoma, we have Christina Bellamy McLean. SOAR will open the next year in the fall of 15, and it's historic because this is the first time that choice, public school choice, has been available to the students and families of Washington State. From Summit Charter Schools in Seattle and Tacoma, we have Jen Davis Wickens. If you look at the results of some of the high-performing charter networks across the nation, they're phenomenal. And what they're doing for students is exactly what we want for students here in our own state. So for example, Summit is preparing 100% of their students to apply to a four-year college. 96% of all Summit graduates are admitted to at least one four-year college. Uh, we need to see these same results in Washington. We know kids can do it. and. We'll, we believe the charter movement will support us in getting there. 
Washington Policy Center, through our new Initiative 1240 Charter School follow-up project, will continue to inform parents and the public about the exciting new opportunities charter schools will bring children and their families in our communities. For example, our latest publication, Opening New Doors for Students, provides an overview of the first new charter schools approved that will open over the next two years. To read this study and keep informed about charter school developments and how these exciting opportunities can be expanded in our state, visit our website at www.washingtonpolicy.org. Three years ago, before Dr. Shelley Redinger was hired, uh, the Spokes Review newspaper asked Washington Policy Center and a few other local community leaders what they wanted to see in a new superintendent. And let me read from that article what we suggested. Quote, the right person should be someone who will come in with a fresh set of ideas and look at impl implementing reforms. That's exactly what Spokane Public Schools, the state's second largest school district, received in Dr. Redinger. Everyone here should realize that in the campaign against charter schools, nearly every school district superintendent in our state, including the superintendent of public instruction, signed a petition against the charter school initiative. Despite that kind of attitude among her peers, Shelley Redinger rose above it all to show real courage and leadership because she kept her focus on what's more, most important, delivering more choices and better opportunities for children and families here in the city of Spokane. Ladies and gentlemen, our 2014 Champion of Freedom Award recipient, Dr. Shelley Redinger. And the plaque reads, for your reform-minded approach to educating our children, which includes leading Spokane Public Schools to become the first school district in Washington State to authorize and open public charter schools, presented at the 2014 Washington Policy Center annual dinners in Spokane. And Dr. Redinger will be with us next week in Bellevue as well. I'm very good friends with the superintendent of Bellevue, so it'd be good to go see him and catch up. I've been called a lot of things. One is shake it up Shelly, uh, but I do like to make change and really do what's best for our students. And I'm an east side girl through and through, uh, born in Spokane, went to Washington State University. So I love this side of the state and I love our state and it needs change. I know when I came back to Washington State, I had been in South Carolina, Virginia, and Oregon. And I came back home and I said, we've got huge problems when South Carolina is more progressive than we are. And uh, we have a lot of work to do in Washington and I'm really up to the challenge and want to lead the charge. So thank you so much, Spokane. It is now time to hear from our keynote speaker and to introduce our keynote speaker, who is also the 2014 WPC Columbia Award recipient. Please welcome WPC Board Director, rather, I'm sorry, Board of Directors member, founder of the Nethercut Foundation and former Eastern Washington Congressman George Nethercut. Thank you very much, Robin. Dear friends, Thank you for being here tonight. It is my great pleasure to have the opportunity and the honor of introducing our next evening speaker. J.C. Watts is a loving husband, a devoted father and grandfather, a successful businessman and entrepreneur, a former member of Congress from Oklahoma, a former professional football player, a former superstar quarterback at the University of Oklahoma who led his teams to many victories. He's been a pastor. He's a rancher. He's a national uh, thought leader. He's a national television personality. And he's one of the finest people I've ever known. In addition to these high qualities that I've just mentioned, 
he is remarkably normal. <laughs> and I'll give you an example of why. When JC and I first came to Congress in 1995, I had the good fortune to be able to choose a congressional page, a junior in high school who could come back to Washington and spend the year working in Congress and going to school at the Page School and living in the District of Columbia for a whole year to learn about government. It was a great opportunity for these young people. The first page that I chose was a young woman by the name of Katie Watts. W-A-T-T-S, same spelling. Katie's parents, you may know, uh, her dad is a great man, uh, a, a physician here in Spokane, Jim Watts. Jim told me, he says, George, I wish I could be a page sometime. I'll take Katie's position. And her mother is Lynn Watts, uh, a fine lawyer and an uh, administrative law judge. And... Um, Katie was a lovely young girl, and uh, she's now out of medical school. She's an emergency room doctor in Montana, and she's married and has a new little baby boy. Katie is also a Caucasian, and her skin is white. Yet, whenever J.C. Watts would see Katie Watts on the floor of the house, He'd say, hi, cousin. <laughs> uh, Hugh Campbell was an all-American wide receiver at Washington State University. He went on to be the coach of five consecutive years of winning Grey Cup champions, championship teams in the Canadian Professional Football League. He won 10 rings overall, five consecutive as a coach. And for those of you who don't know it, the Grey Cup is to Canada what the Super Bowl trophy is to the United States. So it's a big deal. He coached against J.C. Watts when J.C. played in Canada in the professional league. And Hugh and I talked a while ago um, this summer, and he said, you know, I was always frightened to death of J.C. Watts getting the ball. He said, I coached against him, and thankfully we won because we were able to keep the ball out of J.C.'s hands, or else he would have scored against us. In a note that Hugh sent to me accepting this invitation to this dinner tonight for him and his fabulous wife, Louise, uh, Hugh Campbell said this. He said, he looked forward to hearing J.C. Watts talk because as a professional quarter, football quarterback in the likes of Jack Kemp, he said, J.C. Watts has ideas who include everybody. Ideas that include everybody. So I hope you'll uh, enjoy hearing J.C. Watts speak tonight. Before I really tell him to come on up, I'm going to ask him to come up and I'm going to give him an award. It's the Columbia Award from the Washington Policy Center, and I'm going to read the inscription. JC, if you wouldn't mind coming up. It says this, the 2014 Columbia Award to the Honorable J.C. Watts, given in recognition of his public service and inspirational leadership, as well as his commitment to America's school children and free market system, presented at the 2014 Washington Policy Center annual dinner Spokane, Washington, September 23, 2014. Please welcome the Honorable J.C. Watts. Thank you very much. You're kind. Thank you very much. Please be seated. You scared me. You stood up. I thought you were leaving. It's Gosh, dog, it's, it's midnight in uh, Virginia, and I'm usually in bed, George, at about 9.30. So uh, I, maybe I should, uh, you know, give a disclaimer here. I'm not responsible for what you might hear tonight <laughs> over the next few minutes. I, I am so thrilled to be with you. I'm honored that the uh, Washington uh, Policy Center would think enough of me 
to ask me to come and to be with you tonight and as I said at the reception to have an opportunity to see some old friends and George Nethercutt I had no idea and never in my wildest dreams that I think that I would have seen Coach uh, uh, Campbell here tonight and, and, and his bride, Louise, and we did play against each other, and, and he was kind of the, you know, the uh, he kind of ruled the roost in the Canadian Football League, and every other team wanted to be like the Edmonton Eskimos and what they had established there, not dur just during his head coaching years, but also as uh, – uh, the fellow that uh, ran the um, uh, football team and, and, and coach, um, it's uh, just just great to uh, great to see you tonight. I was just thrilled that uh, you would think enough of uh, uh, me to accept George's invitation to come and be with us tonight. I uh, <clears throat> I am no longer a member of Congress. I said I was going to run for three years, uh, three terms. I ended up running for for. Uh, um, um, four terms, and um, uh, I told my wife, I said, you know, I, I, 30 days from retiring, I said, I, I've had a wonderful eight years. I've seen more than ever I thought as a poor kid growing up on the east side of the railroad tracks in Ufall, Oklahoma, would ever see and be able to do and walk the halls that men like Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass and Thomas Jefferson had walked some of the same halls that George and I and Kathy uh, uh, McMorris Rogers uh, walked some of the same halls that uh, we, we've walked over the last 20 years. I said, I've had a great eight years. I said, however, if God gave me only eight years to live, I'd want to live them as a member of Congress because they've been the longest eight years of my life. <laughs> and I... You know, George kind of got the, uh, and, and Washington, you guys contributed pretty heavily to the, the, the success or the takeover uh, that, that we experienced in 1994, the, after the elections of 1994, and, and, and George probably had, I mean, he, he was in the Super Bowl of politics running against a sitting speaker and, and the audacity to have the courage to to do that, but but he did it, and I think um, Washington contributed. I think about five seats: uh, George and Doc and uh, Jack Metcalf, and I think Rick White and and Linda Smith, and and that in that freshman class. And that's been 20 years ago, and that was before I was dying my hair gray. So it was <clears throat> it's, it's been a little little while ago, but uh, those were were great years. We we got a lot done and. And uh, it's always good to uh, see George. Kathy McMorris Rogers, who's here tonight, she actually, Kathy, holds the job that I held when I was in leadership, uh, the conference chairman for Republicans. And then Jennifer Dunn and I, we served in leadership to, together. And I always thought that, you know, Jennifer Dunn was way too classy to be in, in politics. But she did uh, take on that, that challenge to come and serve her state and uh, she did it extremely, extremely well. <clears throat> you know, um, um, we are talking about, or we are in the midst of an organization, as you all know, uh, Washington Policy Center, and, and, and it's a think tank. I was asked about three or four years ago, would I ever run for public office again? And I said at the time, I said, I pr probably, I said, I don't know. I said, I don't get up every day thinking about trying to strategically position myself to run for something. And I, but I did say to this reporter over in the city of Tulsa, I was there doing an event, and I said, I, I don't know if I qualify to run for public office today, simply because I think on both sides, you're literally forced to come to the table on day one with all the answers. And I'm honest enough to admit that I don't have all the answers. I, 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 I don't. And, and so, you know, sometimes I think that politics isn't a thinking person's game. But I'm delightful that the Wallet, uh, Washington Policy Center, it's a think tank. You still think. And you think about transportation issues, and, and you peel the onion on those issues, and you peel the onion on, on uh, uh, transportation issues, and tax issues, and small business issues, and, and, and education issues, and that is a good thing. That is a good thing. None of us have all the answers, 
But I am smart enough in public office that I can, you know, it, it, it's, it's a dangerous thing when somebody can give you the recipe for the cake, but they never cook the cake. That, that's, that's a bad formula for public policy. I am smart enough to pick up the phone and say, hey, you know, Amity, what do you think about this? Or, hey, Dan, what, what do you think about this? You know, Robin, tell me, what, what, what your experience, and, 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 you know, public policy is tough. Good public policy is tough. It takes a lot of listening. It, it, it takes a lot of asking of questions, and, 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 and you know, and it's, and it's expensive. For those who believe that we're on the right side, I, I used to say I, when I was in debates, I would, I would say to my friends that I was debating that say, you know, Congressman uh, Watts, do, uh, do, do, you, do you agree uh, that we should do it like this? I said, if I agree with that, we both would be wrong. Somebody has to think through these issues. These are very, very serious issues that we are dealing with in education and health care and, and transportation and, and, and taxes and all the other things. So I, I appreciate the uh, Washington Policy Center that, that you are an organization that still gives serious thought to how to move the state of Washington forward. And, and to all of you who give, God bless your soul. There's going to be a special place in heaven for those people that will give their hard-earned money to, to, to think tanks to help augment legislators who are honest enough to say that I don't have all the answers. So uh, thank you for uh, what you do and, and, and who you are. And, and, and for those who are contributors, thank you so much um, uh, for that. I, I, um, I, I'm appreciative for... Um, my eight years in Congress, and I, I'm grateful for what I learned during the time that I was, I was in Congress. I, I learned a lot about uh, how to work with people to block good or bad legislation and, and to work with, um, you know, coalition, build coalitions to get good policy passed. And, 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 but it is such a fascinating arena. I learned much. I saw a lot of America up close and personal and had a chance to travel around the country and, and, and come to Washington State and, and, and see Washington State up close and personal with George and somebody that had a passion about this state and, and go to Indiana and go to Texas and, and, and Indianapolis and, or, Indi, um, or, or Indiana and, and, and uh, you know, different states around, the, even California is interesting as they are. And I, I went all over the country uh, and, and getting to see America up close and personal. And I, I learned much, and I'm grateful for that. And, 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 and I also learned how to think pretty quickly on my feet. You know, as a quarterback, you, you kind of have a reporter stick a microphone in your face and ask you some crazy question about the ball game. And, and, and so in politics, it is ten times worse than it was in athletics because, you know, you'll go into some high-security meeting. I was in armed services. We'd go in some high-security meeting, and... And, um, you know, we'd be questioning these generals in and, 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 and armed services committee meeting or we'd go in leadership meetings and you come out from uh, uh, behind closed doors and you have some reporter jump out from behind some pillar in statuary hall and ask you some question that you hadn't been briefed on or in, in, in two days or two weeks, sometimes two months. So you learn to muster up recall as best you could and try to answer the question. And once that happened, and I kind of chuckled, and the reporter said, well, what, what's so funny? And I said, well, I, I said, the way you did that, I said, I'm reminded of a story that I heard about a young fellow that worked at a grocery store, and every night at 9 o'clock, they locked the door. And this particular night, it was about 9.20, and the young man behind the counter had forgotten to lock the door. So in through the door walks this elderly lady, and she says to the young fellow standing behind the counter, she said, young man, I need to buy half a head of lettuce. <laughs> well, he kind of chuckled, and he said, ma'am, he said two things. He said, one, we're closed. I just forgot to lock the door. And he said, and two, we don't sell a half a head of lettuce. She said, well, I need to buy half a head of lettuce. He said, ma'am, we don't sell a half a head of lettuce. She said, young fella, I need to buy half a head of lettuce. And I'm not leaving until you sell me a half head of lettuce. So he said, look, just wait right here. Let me go back and see what I can do. So he goes back to the produce department, says to the produce manager, he said, look, there's this old hag out there that wants to buy a half head of lettuce. Well, he turned around, and this lady had followed him back there. 
he looked and he said, and this dear lady wants to buy the other half. <laughs> well, after she left with her half a head of lettuce, the boss came out and he said, young man, he said, I got to tell you, he said, you're pretty good. He said, I saw that entire ordeal. He said, you were really good on your feet. He said, where'd you learn those skills? He said, oh, shucks. He said, I'm from Eufaula, Oklahoma. He said, in Eufaula, Oklahoma, he said, all you have is old hags and football teams. And the boss said, young man, my wife is from Eufaula, Oklahoma. He said, what position did she play? <laughs> so, so you do learn to think pretty quickly on your feet around that crazy place. I, I've, some of you know, I, my wife and I, we've got, we've got five kids, and, and uh, Amity and I were talking, and she, her oldest child is 23. My youngest child is 23. George, we're empty nesters. We don't have kids in the house anymore, and over the last seven, eight years, we've had two kids in school, and you're going to have to pay for this because 23, 21, they're all that. My wife and I, over the last seven, eight years, we've had two kids in college at any given time. And you know what I found out? Schools are proud of their tuition. <laughs> they're proud of their education. They charge for that stuff. I went to school on a, on, on a stu as a student athlete on, on, a, on an academic, I mean, an athletic scholarship, and I got my education free or somebody else paid for my education. Well, I had to pay for two kids at any given time. And so my wife and I, my son finished last December, so we're getting a little bit of a raise th this fall. And it, it's, it's kind of nice to be able to go to Burger King a little bit more. And so anyway, we, 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 we about three years ago, four years ago, United Negro College Fund called me and asked me for a contribution. And I said, hey, guys, you know I love you. I, I, I've been supportive. And I said, you know, boy, I, I, I love your motto. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. I said, someday I hope to be able to contribute again. I said, but today I am a United Negro College Fund. <laughs> so we, we've gotten all our kids to school. We're making memories with grandkids and having a wonderful time, getting a little bit of our our lives back, but I get an opportunity to travel around the country and still campaigning for uh, colleagues and, 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 and helping to raise a little bit of money for them, trying to get them elected or reelected. And I am delighted here tonight to, um, to uh, be with, with, with you. You know, I, I, um, Abraham Lincoln led America on the idea that the great promises of the Declaration of Independence belong to all people for all time, not just for some men or some people at one time in history. The idea that human freedom is an inalienable God-given right was a radical idea in the 1860s. Today in America, I believe we must be radical in our commitment to the idea that all people have talent, all people have potential, and all people have possibility. I believe in an America that has a fundamental belief in people, a belief in markets, and a belief in human potential. America must be a nation that believes in possibilities, not limits. We must believe in people, not elites. And we must believe in democracy, not bureaucracy. Mr. Lincoln said before his first inaugural, he said, I would rather be assassinated on this spot than give up my beliefs in the Declaration of Independence. And I believe that passion and that belief must be our nation's moral foundation and at the same time a very practical idea for human progress. There was a great political realignment, although I'm not necessarily talking to you tonight about Republican or Democrat politics, but I discovered in my history books or the books that I've read, there was a great political realignment in America when Mr. Lincoln founded the Republican Party out of the old Whig Party. And if you're not familiar with the history of why the old Whig Party died, let me tell you why. They stood for nothing. They had no guiding moral or political principles. They didn't know if they were for slavery or against slavery. It collapsed. 
Mr. Lincoln founded the Republican Party on the profound ideas of freedom and emancipation. And I understand within four years, the Republican Party became the majority party. And I'm convinced the reason that Mr. Lincoln was so successful, so successful and the reason that so many people listened to him was they knew that he believed and people knew that he cared. And friends, Republican, Democrat makes no difference today. That principle still stands true. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I believe we could see another political realignment in America. Not necessarily a political realignment of Republicans and Democrats, but a political realignment that, 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 that with, with candidates that would understand there are certain things that I believe the American people that they're longing for. And it would be helpful, helpful for us to consider if, if you talk about any kind of realignment, it would be helpful for us to consider what that World War II generation, what they did. They gave us the safest, the healthiest, the freest, most prosperous nation known to man. And they belong, and, and long before Nike came along with the slogan, just do it, that World War II generation, George, they just did it. They just served their country. They just served their communities. They got up every day and went to work. They went to work. They understood sacrifice and commitment and, and, and hard work and, and, and paying the price, all the things that my athletic coaches from, from Pee Wee, from, from, from Pee -wee uh, uh, baseball to boxing clear through the Canadian football league. Friends, it doesn't matter what your skin color, liberal or conservative, there is a process for progress. And it includes sacrifice, hard work, paying the price, commitment. All those old fundamental values that we used to hold dear. But again, a political realignment based on several things. Based on one, one, one characteristic I believe would be important if we are to see any kind of political realignment, recognizing that character and leadership still matters. Still matters. For us to say that we can have leadership, that, that we can have a strong America without leadership of character is the same as saying that you can get the water without the wet. Impossible to happen. Secondly, I think America, we are a great nation. But America's not great enough that she can shake her fist in the face of a holy God and expect to get away with it. Thomas Jefferson said this. He said, indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. You see, folks, the real defense of our nation is not in our military, although that's important. But instead, it's in the spiritual convictions, the character, the commitment, and the integrity of our citizenry and our leaders. Secondly, thirdly, <laughs> thirdly, I think it's important that any real lineman understands that peace through strength still matters. And if you've watched any current affairs show over the last 18 months, you've seen that we have had a disruption, that we have had some, some interesting things happen from Ukraine to Syria. Three months after George Nethercutt and I were, were sworn in to the United States Congress, 20 miles from where my kids slept every night, I saw an act of terrorism. 168 people lost their lives in the Federal Murrah Building in downtown Oklahoma City. No telling what might have happened had I been there. 
I was downtown that morning for a prayer breakfast, for the mayor's prayer breakfast. I left an hour before the prayer breakfast ended to go and catch a flight to Dallas. But 20 miles from where my kids slept every night, an act of terrorism was executed. 168 people lost their lives, two dozen kids. Kids that will never grow up to play quarterback at the University of Oklahoma. They'll never grow up to play in the Canadian Football League. They'll never grow up to serve to represent their state in the United States House of Representatives. They'll never get to go to lunch with their grandchild the way I did about five weeks ago. They'll never get to see their 12-year-old grandson play his first football scrimmage of the season the way I did five weeks ago. I know terrorism up close and personal. And friends, something we all should take note of. When evil people say they will do evil people to the United States of America, we better have members of Congress, 535 of them, and we better have a person in the White House that takes them seriously. They are more than a JV team, trust me. And, and terrorists... Terror, terrorists are like, are, are, they're, they're like gypsies. They, 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 they go from mountain, they go to nooks and crannies, and, and they hide out, and they try to find a place long enough that they can, they can organize and they can strategize to wreak havoc on, 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 on their enemies. Today, they're establishing a caliphate from Syria to Mosul and Iraq and beyond. I applaud the president. Although he comes to the game slowly, I applaud him for coming to the game. I'm a pretty simple guy. I grew up in Ufall, Oklahoma, population 2000. My strategy, my philosophy isn't very complicated when it comes to fighting wars and, 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 and fighting the enemy, and the terrorists. My philosophy is pretty simple. We win, they lose. Not, not, not complicated. <laughs> Fuel it, the realignment with entrepreneurial opportunity and advances opportunity in every pocket of poverty in America. From the delta of Mississippi to the urban areas of Detroit to the rural parts of Oklahoma and Washington State. Fuel the realignment by tearing down the walls of prejudice and despair and dependency that keeps many poor people from realizing their dreams and their aspirations. Over the last 40 years in the urban and, 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 and in the rural and urban pockets of poverty, the incentives have been the reverse of everything that needs to be done to create productive hu human behavior and wealth. Think about what we've done over the last 40 years. We've penalized and discouraged savings by welfare moms. We pay people not to work. We discourage investment in poor neighborhoods. We penalize moms, welfare moms from marrying the father of, of the children. Friends, the strength of our nation can't be measured in, in, in GDP alone. The ultimate strength of America, it's our people. It's you. It's it, it's me, it's, it's us, it's our hopes, our dreams, our ambitions, our, our, our talents, and, and most importantly, it's our goodness. Fuel the realignment by, re, by, by reducing people's taxes. I, 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 I am not bashful to say that every tax bill that crossed my desk, that, that crossed my desk every tax bill to reduce Taxes that cross my desk, I voted for. If you want to get in a short line in life, you get in that line of Americans that believe that they are undertaxed. Nobody believes that. And the reason no one believes that is because, think about it. The tax man, we get you from the time you get up until the time you die. You jump out of bed in the morning, your feet hit the floor, go jump in the shower, we tax your water. 
Put your clothes on, we tax your clothes. Eat your breakfast, we tax your food. Jump in your car to drive to work, we tax your vehicle. You stop and get some fuel, we tax your fuel. Go to work, we tax your income. Come home at night, you flop down the lazy boy, watch TV, we tax your furniture. You turn the TV on, we tax your cable. You go to bed at night, you fall on your knees, you pray to a true and living God, you get off your knees, you kiss your spouse, you think that's free. It's not. <laughs> There's a marriage tax. And you just decide, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired of all these taxes. I'll just die. You can't afford to die. There's a death tax. <laughs> Nobody believes that they're undertaxed. And if you want to give the government more, we don't need to pass a bill for you to do that. Just write them a check and in the memo section say, we want this to go toward paying down the debt or we want this to go to the general treasury. We don't need to pass a law for people to give more money to the government. And why should we give money to a government that is, that is so broken? And if you think it's not broken, you consider this. This is your homework. You'd be proud of me as an educator. This is your homework. You go home and you think about this question. Name me one thing today that the federal government does that is better today than it was when they created it. Social Security, going broke. Medicare, going broke. Tax system, structured around all the wrong principles to create productive human behavior and wealth. Public housing is worse today than it was 30 years ago. And although I'm a military person, we've got a military. I, I, I say the same thing for them. There could, I, I submit to you, we could probably reduce the size of the federal government 15%, and you never notice any difference with the exception that it might be better. So again, nobody thinks that they're under tax. Fuel the realignment by creating a quality of education for all children. Government should not mandate that kids go to schools that don't work. Mandate that kids go, through, go to schools that they have to walk through metal detectors. No child should be left behind because he or she comes from a broken home, a poor family, a tough neighborhood. Friends if, our, friends, if our kids don't learn how to read and write and do the arithmetic and gain the computer skills necessary to compete in a global marketplace, then rather than spending nine to $15,000 per year to educate our kids, we spend twenty-five dollars to $30,000 to incarcerate them. And the debate for me in the education space, the education debate, as I said today at lunch, it, I, I am a parental choice in education. I am a charter school supporter. I, I was on the front lines of those battles in the mid-90s when I went to Congress. I've offered education, I've, I've offered amendments on education bills to, to give scholarships to poor kids in Washington, D.C., uh, uh, just 2,000 scholarships. And it was defeated. We had our vote, but we, we got it defeated. I've been on the front line of that debate for a long time. But to me, it's not necessarily about public schools or charter schools or faith-based schools. To me, it's about what works. What works. This young lady asked me a question today in the, in the luncheon that we had on education. I had no idea who she was. Let me tell you something, friends. Groupthink in America is killing us. 
And groupthink in and of itself is not a bad thing because we all kind of, we, we can relate to, to, to groupthink. You know, we, you, you think like the group in, in, in certain respects. Women or, 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 or Italians or, or, or Catholics or Protestants or, or, or white or black or red or yellow or brown. It is, there, there's nothing wrong necessarily with, with, with groupthink. But when groupthink says, ignore the facts. When group thinks says, hey, 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 look, don't, don't, no, no, the uniform doesn't fit, but you still need to wear it. When group thinks says, don't ask where you're marching, just march. I don't mind marching, but you got to tell me where we're marching. And let me tell you, that individual that will step out of that group and say, no, you're telling me that two plus two is, 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 is seven. I, I can't buy into that. Two plus two is four. It takes courage to step outside of the group. But friends, you look at history, every revolution ever started in, 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 in the world, it was someone that stepped outside of the circle and started the revolution. It's difficult to start a revolution from within the circle, from within the group, because the group says, no, 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 you have to think a certain way because you're black, because you're a woman, because you're, you're a man, or because you're white, or because you're brown, or because you're red, or you're yellow, or, 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 you, or you have to think a certain way if you're Democrat or, or if you're Republican. And I've always had enough courage to say, uh, um, uh, Mrs. O'Reilly, I, uh, or, or, or Coach, I, I, I'm not so sure that's the best way to do it. Group think. It takes courage to, to, to defend the truth, to defend the facts when you're defending them by yourself. Senator Daniel, former Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan out of, out of, out of New York, he said something uh, our freshman year in Congress, he said, in Washington, you're entitled to your own opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. You see, we want to be entitled to our own facts. Again, that's why Washington Policy Center is vital. That's why it's so important. Because you're driven by what the facts are. And friends, we have to have standards in education. Four months ago, I couldn't have told you the difference, and you all probably know about, I don't know what Common Core is in the, here, here in the state, but in the state of Washington, but four months ago, I couldn't have told you the difference in Common Core and Uncommon Core. But I would have said this. We all need standards. We need standards in football. We need standards in, 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 in politics. We need standards in education. We, we need some kind of way to keep score because if you're not keeping score, it, it, it's just practice. So we need standards. And I'm not advocating common core standards. Washington State, you all can have your own standards. But I can tell you this, friends, God help us when we put more pressure on the high school football coach to perform than we do the high school English teacher. We fire coaches. <laughs> Fuel the realignment by attacking the, 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 the principles of poverty. Again, we, we reward welfare and unemployment more than we reward working and being productive. I don't believe we should measure compassion by how many people we can have on food stamps, AFDC, and in public housing. I think we should measure compassion by how few people are on food stamps, AFDC, and in public housing because we've helped them climb the ladder of economic opportunity. When we reward families that break up more than we reward families that stay together, you will create poverty. When we reward illicit capitalism on the streets more than we reward the risk taker, the entrepreneur that will take their kids' education money, that will go and get a second mortgage in the home and say, I've got a product or service, I'm going to take it to the marketplace, and I believe I can create jobs and wealth legally. When you reward illicit capitalism more than you reward the entrepreneur, 
you will create poverty. And fourthly, if you really want to create poverty, weaken the link, which we have done so well over the last 40 years. Weaken the link between effort and reward. Friends, I didn't learn that as a Republican legislator. I learned that in athletics. Effort and reward. I learned that as an employee. I learned that picking up pop bottles around Ufall, Oklahoma, and, 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 and you have to have gray hairs or no hairs to remember these days when you could, when a, when a, when a glass, they didn't have cans. They had 10 ounce pop bottles and 16 ounce pop bottles. And 10 ounce pop bottles, you got three cents for every 10 ounce pop bottle you turned in at the, at, the, at the local grocery store. You got five cents for a 16 ounce pop bottle. We had clean neighborhoods. We beat people up for breaking pop bottles. <laughs> that was spending money. You didn't do that. I asked my dad for an allowance. I watched Leave it to Beaver. They got an allowance. I said, this allowance thing is pretty good. <laughs> I went to Buddy Watson and asked him for allowance. He, he immediately said, no, it'll make you a bad hustler. He knew if he would have given me an allowance, I wouldn't have wanted to mow lawns. I wouldn't want to go pick, pick, pick pecans. I wouldn't hustle pop bottles in the neighborhood to go sell them. He said, no. He didn't want to weaken the link between effort and reward. And friends, we also must understand that poverty doesn't create dysfunction. Dysfunction creates poverty. And all those principles that I just shared with you, they're dysfunctional. So therefore, we create poverty. We have people in Washington and America who see themselves as agents for redistributing America's wealth. They believe the only way you can help some is to take it from others. That economy is a giant zero-sum game, and that's not the American dream. I want to build and encourage. I want children raised in an America, in Oklahoma, and Washington State, that exalts their boundless potential instead of imposing limits. I want people treated as resources. Not as a drain on resources. I want children in the inner, inner, inner city to have the same opportunity to realize their dreams as children in the suburbs. And I take it a step further. I believe we have to be intentional. Intentionally going into urban areas, rural areas, poor areas, black communities, white communities, red, yellow, and brown communities. And intentionally offering up hope and opportunity for the future. This is the possibility and potential I want to celebrate, encourage, and hold out to all Americans in Oklahoma and Washington State in contrast to government dependency and despair. And I say to you, I'll have people that will disagree with me. You may disagree with me. But the unity of our country should not require unanimity. We don't all have to look alike or say it all the same way, but we must have a common foundation of character and a common goal of recapturing the American dream for all Americans, red, yellow, brown, black, or white, in Spokane, Washington, or in Eufaula, Oklahoma. I've had my critics when I've challenged my party on education issues. I've had my critics when, 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 when I've challenged my party on, on corrections reform. And there's an organization called Right on Crime that Right on Crime that I signed on to about a year, a year ago as a signatory. I hope you'll go online. Friends, the second largest expenditure in most state budgets behind Medicaid is corrections. In the last... In, in, in the last nine months, I've spent 
I, I, I've taken two trips to Angola prison in Angola, Louisiana. 6,000 inmates there. 85% of them will never see beyond the walls of that prison. They're lifers. They will die in Angola prison. But about 1,200 of them, they will see the light of day again. And we're working with car dealers. And we're working with Walmart. And we're working with other people. That these, these inmates that's going to that, that, that's gonna get out and they're going to see the life of day. We're working with them because we recognize if you've got a record, it is virtually impossible to get a job. So again, if we say we want to make people resources as opposed to being drained on resources, if you've got a record and you can't get a job, you become a drain on resources. So I think it's a better model to say, hey, when they've, when they've, when, when, when they've, if they've changed the air of the way, if we've put them through some good housekeeping seal of approval, we ought to be connecting the dots for them to get gainful employment so they can be a good dad, so they can be a good husband, so they can be a good provider. Now we'll beat them up for being deadbeats, but then when they get out of prison, they paid their, they paid their debt to society. And they get out and they can't get jobs. They become a drain on resources. 75% of the people that will go back to prison this year, the recidivism rate, 75% of the people that will go back to prison this year, they will go back to 70%. They will go back to prison because George Nethercutt was my parole officer and I have a requirement of meeting him once a week. And, and, and one of the requirements in meeting him once a week is that I pay him $25 to $30, $25 to $40, whatever the fee is. 70% of the people that will go back to prison this year, they'll go back because they couldn't pay the $30 that they owed to the parole officer. So we'll lock them up for another year or two and spend $25,000, $30,000 to do it because they missed $75 worth of payments. Newt Gingrich, Bill Bennett, Grover Norquist, others, we've all signed on to this to say, yes, we should be tough on crime, but we should also be smart on crime. Abraham Lincoln said, in spite of the fact when he had his critics, he said, Make sure your feet is in the right place and stand firm. Many issues impacting these United States of America. Thomas Paine said, these are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will end the crisis, shrink from the service of their country, but he that stands by it now deserves the love and the thank you and the thanks men and women. Tyranny like hell, he said, is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheaply, we esteem too lightly, he said. We do have the potential in America to help our poor citizens move from poverty to prosperity to rebuild our broken culture, offer better education in our states and in our nation. We can do that. We've gone from, 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 from stagecoach to 747. We've gone from, from, from Pony Express to Federal Express. We've gone from dictionaries to Google. 1995, when, I went, when George and I went to Washington, blackberry was a fruit. <laughs> but friends, we say that we don't have the capacity to help our poor citizens rise up, to help our small businesses prosper, to do better in our, in, 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 in our government. We do have the potential. And we think the only way to do it, so many think the only way to fix America's problems 
is to tax more. We don't need more taxes. We need more taxpayers. We as Americans do have the potential to reach out to every, reach out to every American child of every ethnic background and every neighborhood and help them achieve God's unalienable right to pursue happiness. Leadership and freedom depends on courage and, and integrity. Leadership and, and, and freedom believes that honor, duty, and country, it's not just a motto, but instead it's a way of life. We in these United States must live every day in that tradition and get up every morning looking at ourselves in the mirror when we're brushing our teeth and saying, what are we doing? augment that World War II generation to make sure that we pass on the safest, the healthiest, and freest and most prosperous nation to our grandkids. In America, we're at the center of freedom, and she deserves from all of us a commitment to be worthy of that honor. And I get up every day, and, or, and so often I ask myself, why are people not more involved? We, 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 we love to, to um, watch the TV shows, and we, we've so gotten to the point that we've allowed MSNBC and CNN and Fox News to tell us how to think or what to think or who we should like or what we should like, and why we shouldn't like it. And, 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 and I, I think that, that there's probably people in this room that if, if 40 years ago someone would have told you that you would be where you are today, you never would have thought it. You never would have believed it. God has so blessed these United States of America. We've seen things happen in our lifetimes. In 1990, when I was elected to state government, we still had parts of Oklahoma that they had party lines in some of our rural areas. And again, you have to have gray hairs or no hairs to remember what party lines. Somebody 35 years or younger, you probably don't even know what a party line is. And I'll tell you, you don't have to go Google it, but a party line is a line that, that Robin and, and George and I, all three of our families, we had the same phone line. And I'd have to get on the phone and say, Robin, get off the phone. I need to use it. Today, 40% of the American people, their primary source of income, it's a, I mean, primary source of communication, it's a cell phone. 40% of the American people, they don't even have landlines. That's how far we've come. And boy, the future is still ahead of us. I want to close you by, by telling you this. One of the reasons I think that keeps us from being engaged with organizations like Washington Policy Center and keeps us from engaging on fighting to sustain the greatness of America. In 1998, 1999, I went to, um, I went to Tennessee, and Georgia went down there for Van Hillary and a couple of Tennessee classmates of ours and, and did some campaigning for them, and I said, I'll come. I said, but I want you to pay for my family, and I said, you know, we'll, we'll come down there and we'll take a vacation, and I'll kind of do a little work and, and play a little bit. So we went to the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee, went to Dollywood, and we were in a place called uh, Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and they've got just gobs of things to do there. So we were at a Cracker Barrel, and, and I asked the young lady that was helping us, that was waiting on us, I asked her, I said, tell me, I said, what are some of the must-see things? We had our three youngest kids with us, and I said, what are some of the must-see things? She said, Oh, you, you've got to see this, and you've got to see that. And, and, and she said, Louise Manziel has a great show, and Louise and I know each other, so we did her show. It was a great show. And she, and, and she after she named four or five things, and she said, and, and oh, yeah, you've got to see the magic show. 
Well, I was not anxious or excited about getting up at a quarter to seven on my vacation to go to watch a magic, magic show that wasn't magic. I know that rabbit's not just popping up out of thin air. And I know you're not sawing your assistant in two. I don't know what you're doing, but I know it's not magic. And the kids were so excited because she made such a big deal out of it. They said, yeah, let's, let's do daddy. Let's go. And Okay, we'll go. Got up quarter to seven, got dressed, drove through McDonald's, bought the traffic, drove through McDonald's, got the sausage biscuits and all the stuff that we got, the orange juice, and we were eating while we were in the traffic. And it literally took us about two hours of traffic was so bad, about an hour and a half to get to this venue. And it was about 9.40 when we got there. The program started at 10 o'clock. And I mean, I'm walking in, and I'm just upset. I'm, I'm not upset. I'm mad. I never should have let the kids talk me into doing this. We never should have done this. This is crazy. This is stupid. You're the dad. You should know better than this. You, you should have been the adult in the situation. So we sat there, and I was pouting. And the guy came out at about 10 after 10 after all the monologue and all that stuff. He came out at about 10 after 10. And at 10.30, I'm nudging my 11-year-old daughter. And I said, Jennifer, did you see what he did to that rabbit? <laughs> it, it, oh, he saw it. He says, how did he do that? Her head's over here. Her feet's on the other end about 10 yards away. How did he do that? I, I don't understand that. I was acting like an 8-year-old. This guy was really good. And afterwards, after about two hours of that, I did something that I never do. I stood in line to get this guy's autograph. <laughs> and I got up to him, and I introduced myself, and we talked, and he said, J.C. Watts, he said, aren't you a senator or something? I said, I'm a House member. I can't get my nose up high enough to be a senator. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm a House member. And, and he said, and we talked and we laughed. And I said, I got to tell you, I was so impressed with what you did. I wanted my kids to meet you personally. I was so impressed with, with your magic. And we talked about it. And, and he said, no, you're right. It, it's not magic. He said, it's entertainment, and he said, it's sleight of hand, and there's ways we do certain things. He didn't tell me how. He said, but it's not magic. You, you, you obviously know that. And we laughed about it, and I left. I have often thought about that two hours that I spent with that young man, with my family. I was wowed. You know, one of the problems we have in America today, we've lost our wow. We're not wowed that we're the greatest nation known to man, that we are the last best hope for freedom in the world. The world looks to us for the leadership that it takes to sustain what we have so enjoyed and so taken for granted over the last 40 years. I'm wild that a kid from Ufall, Oklahoma could serve in the United States House of Representatives. And at the same time, there was a time in his life that he couldn't swim in the public swimming pool. He had to sit in the balcony of the movie theater because that young man believed his coaches and his teachers and his parents and his grandmother to say, if you'll understand sacrifice, commitment, paying the price, hard work, never giving in. You'll see things that in your wildest dreams you never thought you'd see. You'll do things you never thought you'd be able to do. I get up every day looking in the mirror saying, wow. This place you and I call home and the rest of the world calls America, it's a pretty, pretty decent place. But we have to get up every day working to sustain the greatness 
of these United States of America. Thanks very much for letting me come. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Congressman Watts. He is also the author of a pretty phenomenal book, of which a limited number of copies will be for sale in the lobby. Thank you to Amity Schlaes, whose book also is available. Thank you to the staff at the Spokane Convention Center, and to thank you to each one of you who came out tonight. We remind you to fill out those gold surveys as well as the white cards that are inside of your folders, place them in the red envelopes on all of those tables. Consider supporting WPC's contribution, uh, consider rather their work by your contribution. It is tax deductible. When you join the WPC, you'll receive informative publications, including the quarterly magazine Viewpoint, and notices about the more than 40 engaging events throughout the year. I hope you have enjoyed this evening as much as I have, and, and so glad you were part of this. I hope to see everybody again next year when we welcome, wait, uh, I guess we've got to find, wait and find out. That's so mean. <laughs> on behalf of Washington Policy Center, thank you for coming, and I hope to see you bright and early on Good Morning Northwest on KXLY. 5 a.m. comes real early. Have a good night. Drive safe. <laughs>